excited. This is awesome. For um, everyone listening who doesn't know who Jordan is, um, Jordan has been around for forever. I mean, he is like the godfather of like all things conspiracy. And uh, yeah, Jordan, uh, he's a preeminent researcher and independent scholar in the field of occult and religious philosophy. His interest in these subjects began as far back as 1959. He served for three and a half years as the religion editor of Truth Seeker magazine, America's oldest free thought journal since 1873. His work exploring the hidden foundations of Western religions and secret societies creates enthusiastic responses from audiences around the world. He has conducted dozens of intensive seminars, hosted his own radio talk shows, guests on more than 600 radio shows, and written, produced, and appeared in numerous television shows, documentaries, including two-hour specials for the CBS TV network, as well as the internationally acclaimed five-part Ancient Mystery series, all devoted to understanding ancient religions and their pervasive influence in the world today. His work on the subject of secret societies, both ancient and modern, and their symbolism, or and their symbols, has fascinated audiences around the world for decades. Considering, considering the rapid moving events of today and the very real hidden religious agendas play in our modern world, modern war-torn world, he feels these controversial subjects not only interesting to explore, but too important to ignore. His extraordinary presentations include documents and photographs seldom seen elsewhere. And one of my first experiences with seeing something that Jordan had done uh, was where he was talking about the origins of Hollywood and how it got its name. And I thought that this was so interesting. And Jordan talked about how the uh, name of Hollywood was uh, put together because a magician's wand is taken from a holly tree and thus we get Hollywood and that just blew my mind and it continues to blow my mind today and with that I wanted to bring on Jordan Maxwell and uh, just dive more into magic and word origins secret societies and the best person I could think to talk to about that is Jordan Maxwell how are you doing today Oh, thank you very much, Brian, for having me on. I'm always happy to be with you. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I've been I've been talking about these off the wall subjects for uh, since 1959, 60. Mm. Uh, God knows how long ago that was. It was three years before Kennedy was assassinated. I was giving lectures in East Los Angeles on secret societies and fraternal orders in politics and religion. And the day Kennedy was assassinated, I was on my way down to uh, East Hollywood to uh, deliver a lecture on the secret societies in world government uh, the day Kennedy was assassinated. And I, and I talked about how uh, presidents and, and world leaders can be assassinated and killed by secret societies and nobody will ever know, you know, what the, what the story really was. And so... People understand when you talk about mafia and, and organized crime. Well, that makes sense. We understand. We've seen enough movies that we can visualize organized crime and criminal syndicates and mafia and so so forth. But it never, it really has never really occurred to people that that's what your government is like. It's very very powerful guys that, that you know that have uh, fraternal ties uh, to each other. You know, they take care of each other. You know, uh, you know lawyers cover for each other. <laughs> Cops cover for each other. Uh, politicians cover for each other. I mean, even, you, you know, people do it normally at work. You know, you're going to cover it for your, uh, your, your boss at work, you know. And so it's normal. And I understand that. And, of course, well, like I said, when you get into big-time money, like organized crime, etc., you better cover, you know, for your friends, and they better cover for you. And so, I've always known that that's what's happening. You know, doctors cover for each other, politicians cover for each other, and so it, it became apparent to me at a very early age, in my late teens, that that's what was going on in the world, is that we have 
Uh, the world we live in is actually organized chaos and crime because uh, while people have to make their way, we have to build bridges and build buildings and have telephones, etc., etc. Uh, that requires people getting organized and getting together. We set up something called the phone company or the gas company or the water and power, and so people work together. Uh, and it's all it's all business, like the mafia says. It's just business, just money, and somebody was going to do it. <clears throat> but when you really begin to look at the uh, way the world actually, in fact, works, it's absolutely astounding. Because nothing in this world works the way you think it does. Nothing. Banks do not loan money ever. <clears throat> There are laws that basically say on the books that banks cannot loan any money, ever. Uh, the police department does not do what you think it does. Uh, universities and colleges do not do what you think they do. Uh, so the, the bottom line is, I mean, the, I guess the only one that does what they say they do is the, is the fire department. Because they say they put out fires, well, I know I've seen them do it, so I, they are right. But everybody else, I, I, any other institution, does not do what you think they do. And the governments do not work the way you think they do. Uh, the whole world is totally different, and especially is that really a trip when you start finding out how business works. Uh, commerce. If you look up the word commerce in a law dictionary, look up the word commerce. And you will see that commerce is said to be sexual contact. Sexual, uh, anything which is sexual is referred to as commerce. It's a business. That's a supply and demand. It's a business. And that's why if you're getting married, you have to have a marriage license. Because it's a business. And, uh, and, and so if you're a business, of course, it is, uh, who you marry is none of my business. Thank God, and uh, and who I'm who I'm sleeping with is none of your business, and so but it's business, but it's none of your it's not any of your business, but it's my business, and so you know when I see you come out of say a restaurant one night with a girl, and I say to you, you know that girl you were with last night, she's bad company. She's bad company, and you say, look at mind your own business, business company and then I find out you're going steady and you're going to get married and now she's going to be your partner so you got a partner in business and company yeah the whole idea of, of relationships between human is business but what I'm doing with, with my friends is none of your business <laughs> and so you begin to see how it works that life is a business and so then from there, you begin to understand, you know, why do we have to have banks? Banks, uh, banks are on both sides of a river. They're called river banks. What does a river bank do? It directs the flow of the current, see, because the water is a current. It's an ebb and flow. And so your money is like water. So we say, you know, money, money goes through your hands like water. No. Money is water by law. It's the liquid asset, and uh, it's the ca it's the cash flow. You it's liquidity, liquid liquidity. Either you got the cash and the flow, or you don't, right? Mm -hmm. And so you begin to see how money is considered by international banking as water, and therefore you are like seventy-eight to eighty percent water in your body. So money is based on your body and the water in your body. Jordan, this it's is called, this uh, to me when I when I hear this, like immediately in my head, <clears throat> like I go immediately to how does this all play into magic and the word meanings of how this bigger uh, thing of magic is controlling us through words. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really a very uh, dark and deep subject about how banks work. Uh, let me give you an example. First of all, in Western civilization, that's England, America, Western Europe, 
Australia, New Zealand, Canada, etc., in the Western world. You do not own anything. I don't care if you pay cash for your home or cash for a new car. When you drive it off the lot, you do not own that car. You could have paid full price for it, cash. You do not own it, period, end of sentence. You have an equitable interest in the car in that you you put down $30,000 in cash to buy a new car. Therefore, you have an interest in the car, at least a $30,000 interest in the car. So if I want that car, I have to give you, uh, you know, something to pay for your interest in the car. You've got money in it, and they're not just going to give it to me. So I have to give you something because you have an interest in it. So it's called an equitable. Uh, I have to equalize what you put into it. I have to give it back to you, and then I take the car. So you have an equitable interest in the house, in the car, in the boat. But important, you do not own it. There's a big difference between having an equitable interest in something and owning it. The only way you can own anything in Western civilization is if you have a uh, a lodial title. It's called a lodial title. And uh, when you have an allodial title, that means you own it. So it's uh, it's let me give you an example of how when I say you don't own anything and the reason why you don't own anything is because you never paid for it. You can't own something without paying for it. And if you don't pay for something, uh, then you don't own it. And if you don't own it, then somebody else owns it, whoever owned it to start with. So uh, to show you how uh, you don't own anything, let me give you an example. Suppose you are a painting contractor, and I hire you to paint my office. And you come and you look at the job and you estimate the job to be a hundred bucks to paint my office. All right, and I agree to it. Now we're talking about commerce that's regulated by the state. You're a state approved contractor. And we're doing contracts, we're doing money changing. So this is business. And uh, so you paint my office when you're through according to the way commerce works, you bring me a, a bill for $100. So now I owe you $100 and you're handing me a bill for 100 bucks, right? So I then turn around and reach in my wallet and I pull out a $100 bill and I give it to you and you're paid. I, I paid you, here's the 100 bucks. I didn't pay you, I didn't pay you anything. You gave me a bill for a hundred dollars, so I gave you a hundred dollar bill. If you had given me a bill for twenty dollars, I give you a twenty dollar bill. <laughs> if you gave me a a, a bill for a thousand dollars, I give you a thousand dollar bill. So the point is, I'm giving you a hundred dollar bill because you gave me a hundred dollar bill. So when I give you the hundred dollar bill, that means you now owe me a hundred dollars. But since I owe you $100, all we need to do is just keep record of it. So I didn't pay you anything. But what I did is I discharged the debt. So when you're walking across a carpet and you're building up the electricity and you touch a piece of metal and it shocks you, why? Because the, it was a discharge. So that's why I, you know, when you're in the military, you don't get kicked out. They discharge you because you are electricity and they are discharging you. They are releasing you and letting you go. Why? Because your battery is a battery. It's a biological battery that generates electricity. That's why your muscles move. You know, your, your body can move because of electricity. It's called biological electricity. And so if you get in trouble with the law and you can't pay the bill, then they will put you into a cell. That's what a battery is referred to as a cell. So they're going to put you in a cell because you're a biological battery and you're in a cell. So it's all based on, all commerce around the world is based on water. 
and water is in relation to water money is ships that's what's on, on water all over the world so the ancient peoples of the world and especially in Rome the ancient peoples realized that there were only two things on the earth you can talk about all kinds of things that, uh, that are here but uh, basically there's only two things on the earth land and water so the people live on land and ships are in the water so therefore we have two kinds of law the law of the land and then we have the law of the sea the maritime admiralty law which is the maritime admiralty is called the law of the sea the law of water and the law of the sea is called banking law so the idea is, is that the law of the land is the customs of the people that live on a particular piece of land so if you're in South Africa you can do things in South Africa you cannot do in Russia if you're living in China there are things you cannot do if you're living in California so why because of the law of the land the people who live on a particular piece of land have their own customs the way they do things and they don't do things the way you do it in, in, in Asia. So <clears throat> the law of the land is the custom of the people that live on the land. But the law of the sea is money, cash flow, the liquid asset. And so um, how does that work? Well, I'll give you an example. Since I said your body is water, about 80% water, all money is based on you and your body and it's called maritime admiralty law um, and and of course the big money that's made on water is in ships so therefore we have something called today uh, shipping and uh, and then we apply the word ship to everything we do so we have a citizenship uh, we have uh, you know uh, dealership a friendship uh, scholarship I mean hell we could go on for an hour all the different words that we use but the ship right why because that's all we are is water we are floating out there where you know some people's houses are quote underwater some people have offshore accounts other people are laundering money uh, the banks are going to put a levy a levy on you uh, so all the terms in commerce are related to water. Uh, very interesting, especially when you begin <coughs> to see how this works. When a ship pulls into harbor, um, where a ship parks is called its berth, B-E-R-T-H. So if you're going to go on a ship, if you're going to go for a vacation on a ship, you've got to find out which harbor the ship is in and then when you get there, there's going to be 50 more ships there. So which, where is that particular ship? Well, you have to find out where that ship's berth is. It's called B-E-R-T-H, it's berth. The berth is where the ship is sitting. And so when a ship pulls in on water, it's coming in with, say, $700 million worth of Toyotas or televisions or whatever, and the ship pulls in and parks in its berth, all ships... Uh, if it's an airship, a rocket ship, sailing ship, it doesn't matter. All ships are female. All captains of ships, no matter what kind of ship it is, sailing ship on the water, a rocket ship, a flying ship, airship, it doesn't matter. Captains will always talk about their ship as being she. By law, all ships are female. So the captain will say, oh, she's a good ship, and she's very seaworthy, and she's done this, and she and I have been working for years. What do you, what do you talk about <coughs> she? Ships are always female because the female produces the product. When that airplane lands with 300 people paying $1,000 for, for a trip, uh, that airplane lands with money. They are, they, are, they are shipping the sardines, they're shipping the fish, they're shipping the people, and so it's making money. So therefore, when the ship pulls into a harbor, where it parks is called its berth, 
and every piece that's being sold, every automobile, every, every TV, no matter what it is, must have its own paperwork. Every piece coming off that ship must have its own certificate of manifest. In other words, how, how many doors does it have? Uh, was it green? What color was it? What does it weigh? What's the serial number on it? And uh, does it have air conditioning or what? And so each piece coming off that ship must have what is called a certificate of manifest. Because yesterday it wasn't here, but it manifested today. Here it is. So you've got to have a certificate to identify it. So it's called a certificate of manifest. And so each item has to have a certificate. Why? Because it's sitting on the ship, and the ship is in her birth. So that's why when you came down your mother's birth canal and her water broke, you came into the world in water, on, on water. So therefore, if you want to be born again, like Christians say, then you have to go back and to find a river somewhere or a lake and have them baptize you. Why? Because you've got to go back into your mother's water and to be born again. And so when you come out of uh, the, the ship, uh, when you bring the, sh uh, the, the, the uh, boat, when you bring the car or the TV, as I said, each uh, each item has to have its own certificate. Why? Because it's sitting in her birth. And so it's called a birth certificate. So when you're born, you have to have a birth certificate because your mother was the ship <laughs> and she, uh, she delivered the product. And so, uh, and so you have to have a birth certificate. So what you don't know is that your body is, uh, is on a certificate. It's on a piece of paper in the New York Stock Exchange. And today, your very body, in the body of your wife, a girlfriend, a child, is actually on the stock market in New York. Your body is being bought and sold and used as collateral uh, in, in international business. The, you know, it's a very interesting study about how commerce really works. And all of this is, of course, connected to the fact that um, the United States Originally, in 1776, when the United States was founded, uh, incidentally, the United States was founded as a republic. It never was a democracy. Democracy is the worst possible form of government you could dream up on the earth. Because democracy comes from the Greek word demos, D-E-M-O-S, demos. A demos is a crowd out in the street. And so when you see a riot going on, we call it a demonstration. Why? Because they are demonstrating. Demo, meaning there's a riot out in the street. Well, that's a hell of a government. You know, that's a terrible kind of a government to have a riot out in the street, and they will decide who lives and who, who will die. That's not government. That's chaos. And so that's, and that's what we call demonstration or democracy. Well, that's what they that's want, what, is the order out of chaos. Exactly. That's exactly what's happening. Yeah. So, I'm just saying, so when you understand how uh, commerce works, you understand how government works, uh, why do we have police? Uh, in America, we have something, a, a law enforcement is called police. Why? And the reason why we have, and the reason why we use that word police is very simple, once you understand it. Uh, the United States, when it was founded in 1776, was founded as a republic. Uh, and a republic is a, is a society based on laws, okay? Um, and so, but in, seven, but 1848, 1848, shortly after America was founded, there was a group of men in England, a group of wealthy bankers and, and brilliant uh, uh, criminals got together in England and they found, they formed an, or, an organization and they called their organization, uh, it's like a Masonic order, but they called their organization the League of Just Men, J-U-S-T, Just Men. Not because it was only men in the organization, no, just as in justice. In other words, they were going to help bring justice into the world. 
So they recall they they call they call themselves the League of Just Men, and they represented justice. And this is why today in courts, uh, you know, a judge will tell you there is no justice. There's just us, and therefore the just the League of Just Men decided that they wanted to run the world. And they were very wealthy and very criminal-minded people. And so they wanted to run the world, and so they founded an organization called Communism. And they promoted the idea of the idea of everybody getting together into one uh, organization, to one idea. Everyone works together for one organization. And so they helped to overthrow the United States government back in 1848, 1846, 47, and 48. And then, of course, in the 1860, ultimately, that led to a uh, the, uh, the Civil War. Well, here's what you need to know, that after the Civil War was over, there was no United States of America at all. The United States of America did not exist after the Civil War. Why? Simple because hundreds of thousands of men killed each other in the United States. So we were a lot of things, but not united. We were not any longer united. We were at enemies, the, the, war, the war against the North and the South, killing each other. We were not united. We're at war. So therefore, when the war was over, we're not united anymore. We killed each other. We've been murdering each other. There's too much hatred and too much bloodshed. So we're not united anymore. Therefore, the United States no longer existed after the Civil War. However, there, the people are still here. So if the people are still here and there's no longer a United States of America, then what are you going to do with them? What are you going to do? How are you going to organize this? because your, your, your government is gone. So what they decided to do, some very wealthy and clever men, what they decided to do was form a company, a corporation, and incorporate it in Delaware, Delaware Corporation. So they incorporated, they, they, they got together and decided to form a company, a big corporation, and they call that corporation the United States. <coughs> United States corporation not the united states of america republic no the united states corporation and it's a it was a it's a company it's a corporation and therefore they said that anyone that would be a member of their corporation would be called a citizen and so today the corporation is called United States Corporation. So today, if if somebody asks you, if the cop asks you, are you a U.S. citizen? And you think, of course, uh, the U.S. is my country, and I'm a citizen. So yeah, I'm a U.S. citizen. That's not what it means. You need to go back and look at that word, U.S. citizen. U.S. is not the United States of America. That's U.S.A. United States Corporation Incorporated in Delaware back in the 1870s, 1870, 71, a corporation was founded, a company like Sears, like uh, like uh, uh, Exxon Oil, you know, it's like General Electric. It's just a big corporation. Well, according to corporate law, all corporations have to have a president. Okay, so we got a president of the corporation. All corporations have to have a vice president. That's the law. Okay, so we got a vice president. And all corporations must have a secretary treasurer. That's corporate law. So, okay, so we got a secretary treasurer. So, therefore, Obama and, and Bush and all the other uh, Marxist, Leninist, Soviet, communist, uh, uh, treasonous uh, criminals. Uh, they were presidents of a corporation. They're not the president of the United States of America because there is no president. There is no United States of America, so how could you have a president of the United States of America? So you have a whole new kind of government called the United States government, which is a company. It's a corporation. It's a business. And so when, when I see young people signing up for military duty. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, what are you talking about duty? 
you, know, you, know, you need to talk to a 67 or 70 year old man like me when you want to talk about business and government. Because young people that are, are told, well, you have a duty to America. You have a duty. You don't have a duty. What are you talking about, duty? Uh, you might as well tell, I might as well tell you, you have a duty to Ford Motor Company. They need somebody to go out and work for free and, and go in the jungles and try and find some rubber for their company. And you have a duty. You need to go do that for Ford, for General Electric. Yeah, General Motors uh, needs you. And so you've got a duty. Uh, but what do you mean you've got a duty to go to war for your country? You're not going to duty for the United States of America. You're not going to war. You're going to war for the corporation, the company. And if you've got any brains at all, you might want to start looking at who owns the United States. Huh? Who owns the corporation called United States which actually, in fact, owns you and your body on the New York Stock Exchange. You need to start looking at this and seeing what's really going on here, how this world really works. Now, let me get back to what I was talking about. I said, where does the word police come from? All right, United States is now no longer the United States of America. Uh, freedom and liberty and justice for all is gone. It's gone during the Civil War, it's over. And so in 1871, we now have a company, a corporation, and the corporation has a president, right? And so a company like General Electric or General Motors or Ford Motor Company or, or whatever, they have what is, they cannot make laws. I mean, Sears or some big corporation in your town cannot make a law for everybody in the town. It's, it's ludicrous. They can't make a law. They can have their own policy in their company, but they can't make a law in town. So there is no such a thing as a law as such. We merely have uh, what is called public policy, meaning that if you're going to work for Ford Motor Company, and what they tell you, that you, what time you have to be in, at work, what time you can get off, how long you can take for lunch, how many breaks you can take, etc. Those are not laws written down in laws under the Constitution. No, they're just the policy of the company. So they have policy. So now you have what is called policy makers. The politicians make policy. And so when the politicians decide what the policy will be for the corporation, you need to have in-house security to make sure people know that you're supposed to be here at 7 o'clock, not 9, and you leave at 4 o'clock, not 3. And so we have in-house securities for the policy from the politicians, and we call them police. <coughs> so the police are the, you know, are, are the armed forces who enforce the policy for the politicians, police. So the police are merely enforcing a policy. It's not the law. There is no law. It's only a policy. But how do they make that policy become law to you? It is the way you spell your name. There are two ways to spell your name. One is uppercase and lower. Capital letter, then lowercase. Capital letter, and lowercase. Anytime you spell your name that way, your name represents your flesh and blood body. So your flesh and blood body is represented when you write your name, capital, uh, like me, uh, capital J, then uh, lowercase, uh, J-O-R-D-A-N, uh, the capital letter, then lowercase, capital letter, lowercase. That represents your physical flesh and blood body. But if you're working for the corporation, and you are a U.S. citizen, then your name is in all capital letters. All capital letters means that you are a, M a member of, <coughs> or an employee of a corporation. That's why on your driver's license, insurance cards, your bills, gas bill, your credit card bills, I don't care what it is, if it's a bill of any kind, if it's a piece of business of any kind, your name 
must be by law in all capital letters because there is no law that's connected to you. Your flesh and blood is under no law. Your mother can't even control you. Your parents didn't even have a, a way of controlling you. They don't know what you're thinking or what you're doing. So if your own mother and your father couldn't control you, and they can't, and your wife can't control you, and you can't control your children or the people around you, then the, obviously nobody can control anybody else. So how does the government do it? Very clever. They make two of you. They make one which is private that nobody can control. That's private. And then there's a public you. So now there's two of you. One is controllable because it's in the public venue. So, in the way, so what I mean is that when you are dealing with your friend and nobody knows that he's there, just you and him, and you're making a deal between you and him, nobody even knows he's there, nobody knows who he is, and nobody cares. That's private between the two of you. But if you're going to put a lot of money together and, and open up a business, now it's business. Now it's now you're going public. And now you're doing things together in the public. So now your name must be in all capital letters. Because you're now going to capitalize, meaning you're going to be making money. And therefore you have to have contracts. And the reason why is because it goes back to maritime admiralty law. Um, it goes back to British law, in English uh, maritime admiralty, British law. Reason why it's called British because there's a world of difference between being British and English. Two different words. English is a bloodline, but British comes from a Hebrew word, a Jewish word, Brett, B R E T H, Brett. A Brett in Hebrew is a contract. So if you're going to buy a home in Israel, you're going to buy a new car, you have to sign a Brett. A B R E T H, a Brett, is a contract or a covenant. And in Hebrew, the word man is ish, I-S-H. In Hebrew, is man. It can be also more than one. It can be men. The correct way to, to pronounce it in Hebrew is ishi. Ishi means man. And so if you're an ish and you are going to buy a house or a car or do some kind of a deal, you're signing a Brit. And so a Brit-ish, that's why you will become known as a Brit-ish. You're signing a contract as a man, a Brit-ish. And so Brit simply means Brit is a contract, man is ish. So there's a difference between being English and Brit-ish. Uh, we are Brit-ish because we're men signing contracts. So uh, as I said, it's a long story about how commerce and banking works. But it's a very interesting story about how it's connected to your body, your family, your mother and your father's body as a security on the New York Stock Exchange. And the reason why is because all the people that work for Ford Motor Company, for instance, as an example, everybody that works for Ford Motor Company in any country of the world doesn't matter. If Ford is hiring you and you get your paycheck from Ford, I don't care if you're in Israel or Africa, it doesn't matter. You are part of Ford Motor Company, period. And therefore, the whole association of, of workers in the, Ford, in the Ford Motor Company Corporation is referred to as the body uh, social. It's the body social. The social body called <coughs> Ford Motor Company employees. And so, therefore, if the employees show up, if the employees show up and they do their job, uh, you know, if you're sweeping the floor or whatever it is you're doing, if you show up and do your job, and that helps the company to make money and to operate, then you are a security uh, for the corporation. And the corporation is called the body social. So you are a social security for the corporation. And so, at the end of your uh, at the end of your uh, working for the company, after so many years, you get social security. No, you are the security for the body social. 
And so they pay you for your time and for you being secure by uh, being on your job every day, doing your job, and the company made money because of you. So they give you a little a dividend at the end of your life, and they give you social security. <laughs> Why? Because you are the security for the body social. This is absolutely That's where we get social security. I'm, this is absolutely incredible, wow. Jordan. Like the, this whole my whole worldview is completely changing Mine after too. this. <laughs> absolutely, I. You just opened my eyes to some stuff that I believed all these years, but you just yeah. solidified so many things that Yeah, because I mean we just we just hear all these words and terms and we just do whatever it is we do and nobody ever stopped to question what are we doing? Why do we have police? What is a sheriff? And Absolutely. why do we have to get why do we have to have a a, a, a contract uh, and a permit to get married? I it's remember being simple. pretty uh, freaked out when I was younger and learned that I had like a social security number and that totally <laughs> freaked me out. I'm like, what, what do you mean? I got like a number assigned to me, you know, and I had no choice in the matter. Right. Well, uh, do you have uh, in your wallet, your social security card? Um, I've, either one of you, I believe it's in my card. I don't, I don't think my I car, have, I don't have it with me. I, I memorized the number though. See if you've got it and I'll show you something. Let's see if I have mine. I probably don't. Phil's looking right now. You know, I don't think I do. Oh, yeah, I do. Oh, here we go. Yeah, it's all beat up, but yeah, I got it. Okay, now pull it out. Okay. And look on the back. Okay. Do you see a set of numbers on the back? Yeah, that starts with a D. Okay. Now, did it start with a D? It doesn't matter. Every everyone's different. The D is simply telling you which bank it's under. <clears throat> so that set of numbers. All right. Now hold it out. Keep that out. Now do another thing. Do you have a one dollar bill in your pocket? Either one of you? No, I got a twenty. You're right, like I me. You don't even have a dollar. I don't. Yeah, I don't carry. I don't <laughs> carry cash. Do you have any bills in your pocket? I have bill? a ten dollar bill. Five? Huh? I got a ten dollar <coughs> bill. I didn't hear you. I got a ten dollar bill. Okay, take it out. Okay. Okay. On the front, you will see two sets of numbers: one on the right and one on the left. Okay. Okay. Now take the back side of of his social security card. Look at the back side. Take both and put them together. The back side of his social security card and the front side of your ten dollar bill and you will see those numbers and, and letters match. Do you see what I mean? The Did back of the social security card has a letter and numbers. Right. Letters and numbers on the back of a social security card, letters and numbers. I Correct? See them. Yes. Okay, what is on the $10 bill if it isn't a letter and numbers? Correct. So they, 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 it's a concept that's on both the Social Security card and the $10 bill. Yes, absolutely. Okay, the reason why I'm saying is because the numbers on the dollar bill match somebody's Social Security card somewhere on the earth. Wow, that's pretty wild. Wait, wait, wait. Let's see the if they if this is the same amount of numbers. Yeah, it is. I already looked. I never so from thought now of on. That. So from now on, when you when you're getting money, uh, when you're doing business and getting money, check the check the serial number on the bill and see if it's your social security number on the bill. So and we so are if literally it happens in currency. by chance to be your social security number on the bill, then that means that money is based on your personal body, on your flesh and blood. The blood in you is represented by that bill. That's your money. Why? Because the serial number matches your social security. And so your social security, your body, is a security for the body social. Mind blown. Corporation. <laughs> Jordan, how does this play into the bigger picture of what we were talking about a little bit before we started the show about your latest research into the Illuminati and what's going on with all of that? Yeah, that's that's uh, that's, <laughs> that's really uh, 
quite interesting what's what's going on there. Uh, I, you know, I come across many many years ago. Like I said, I started doing this kind of research into words and terms and government seals and symbols and flags and halotry and coats of arms and governmental seals uh, a long time ago, some 60 years ago. I've been studying this subject uh, for many, many years. And, uh, you know, today we hear a lot about secret societies in the Illuminati. Well, that's a very big subject. I started talking about Illuminati back in ni early 1967. That's like, I don't know, uh, 55, 56 years ago, something like that. 1967, I started talking publicly about the Illuminati. Uh, and I was talking in Hollywood. I was doing lectures all over Hollywood and motion picture studios. Uh, I was giving lectures in downtown Hollywood um, uh, on secret societies, Knights Templars, the Federal Reserve, uh, national treasure, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, etc., etc., uh, and uh, and and so it caught on in Hollywood. People began to uh, you know recognize me in my lectures, and uh, and I started getting inquiries from Hollywood, from uh, directors and producers, and especially writers, uh, motion picture writers, and producers. And I was talking to movie stars all the time. I, I would give lectures and there'd be major movie stars would show up and they're just interested to hear the bullshit that I'm talking about, the craziness. <laughs> and, uh, and then they would tell other movie stars and then they would tell directors and I'd get phone calls. from. And so eventually, uh, talking about this enough back in the late 60s, 70s, especially in the 70s and 80s, and Hollywood, it finally, finally uh, started to sink in. And now Hollywood is making movies like National Treasure and and uh, Da Vinci Code and all of that, where um, Tom Hanks is a uh, an expert on symbols and emblems and secret societies. I don't know where they got that from. And uh, I think so, they got it from you. <laughs> uh, yeah, and so. Um, but a lot of people in Hollywood know about these subjects and are writing about them. And of course, like History Channel, the Discovery Channel, are you know making all kinds of television shows about the Knights Templars and all that kind of stuff. I was doing that back before there was a, a, a History Channel before it even existed. You were the History Channel before yeah, they yeah. had it. <laughs> so incredible. So the point being is that there is a big story here about who runs the planet, who owns the the planet. And where did we come from, and who owns us, and what are we talking about slavery, and and uh, why, uh, how, how explain how we humans are on the stock market? And that's true because you know if your if your daughter is getting married, and she's marrying a boy that comes from a wealthy wealthy family, uh, we say, well, my daughter's getting married, and the guy she's marrying, he comes from good stock. Good stock? What is she doing, marrying a cow? No, she's marrying someone from a wealthy family. And so he has stock. He is himself good stock. Why? Because he represents a lot of money. And so the word stock becomes the stock market, and stock is usually animals. Well, that's what we are. We're just a bunch of animals. Some of us come from good stock, and the others are just common stock. And most of them, 90 percent of us in America, we're just common stock. Nothing special about any of us. But there are some people who have come from good stock. And so we are, in point of fact, stock. And that's why if you're looking for a job, you don't go to the stock market. You go to a human resource because that's all you are is a resource. Cows are nothing but a resource. They're made into hamburger and they can make $10,000 off the right, right cow if he's big enough. And so it's, it's, you're just looking at the cow as a piece of business, and he's a stock. And so uh, that's what you are. You are a stock. And, uh, and so they're making money off of you, again, because you are uh, a biological battery, and you, you represent energy, 
and uh, and you represent the stock on the stock market. So today, the New York stock market is actually dealing in humans. They're buying and selling humans uh, on the stock market today. So there's a hell of a story here about how all of this stuff really works. Most people have no idea in the world about any of this. But once you sit and listen to about four hours to somebody explain in detail how a bank works, uh, how government works, how society operates, or what the law, then you find out why you need to get a license when you get married, because it's just a business. Like I said, who I marry is none of your business. <laughs> and, uh, and and what I do is none of your business, but who you marry is none of my business. What are you talking about business? Well, it's, it's, that's all it is, is business. So if you're going to get married, uh, she, her body is on the stock exchange in New York. She's a corporation. You are a corporation. So she's a corporation. So now General Motors is getting ready to do business with Ford Motor Company. Two corporations are getting ready to do business. So if you're going to do business, then you better get a license. It's called a business license. So you better get a license because if it don't work out, if you're, if you're uh, joining forces of two different corporations coming together to create a product, if it doesn't work out, you're not going to God. You're going to court. You better bring your money and your house and your car and anything you own because it's just business. And she's going to teach you what business is really all about. <laughs> and so uh, and so, when you see how courts work, you see how the police work, uh, government works, commerce, banking. You know, when you go into a bank and you want to uh, borrow money to buy a new car, the law actually says, maritime law says that banks cannot loan money. You cannot do that if you're a bank. You can hold the money and pay interest and all of that and do the, the banking, but you cannot loan money. Why? It's simple. Because if I bring, say, $50,000 of my money in and put it into the bank, and the next day you come in and you want to buy a boat that costs $40,000, and they're going to give you 40000 of my money to buy your boat. I don't think so. I didn't put my money in the bank so you can buy your damn boat. You better back up and think again. I'm not giving you my money to buy your boat. Well, where does the bank, how does the bank, uh, if you go in to buy a new car and it costs you 30000 and I just put 120000 in yesterday, they're going to give you 30000 of my money to buy your car? I don't think so. And so, well, where are they getting the money then? How are they giving you 30000 Oh, well, that's different. Here's the way they do that. When you go in to buy a new car, they have paperwork. The, the contract is a paperwork on the car. The paperwork on that car, uh, first of all, it tells you how much the car is worth. Why? Because they have, uh, they have what is called a, what's the word, uh, the guy who decides how much a, a piece of property is worth, an appraiser. They have a state appraiser appraising that new car that came off the ship last week. He appraised that uh, car at $31,000. Therefore, the paperwork that represents that car is worth $31,000 in business. That paper in your hands worth $31,000. Now, if you want to buy that car, the, the, the auto agency gives you the paperwork, and you take the paperwork to the bank. That paperwork represents $31,000 in business, and you give it to the bank. Now, the bank has just given, gotten $31,000, in, in and they just got $31,000 given to them. So it looks good. The bank made money today. Well, they didn't make money. They took yours. <laughs> right. And so your, your, your paperwork is worth $31,000. Well, they took it. Now they have $31,000 in the bank. So what they do is they take that paperwork and they open up a bank account and put that $31,000 into the bank account. And the bank account is for you. So they put your name on the bank account, but you don't know that. There's a bank account being opened for you. And they open the bank account with your name 
and you don't have to sign for it. They they sign for the whole thing. They do it in private. They go in the back room with the paperwork, and they're doing the paperwork at the car agency. You don't know what they're doing. They're opening up a bank account for you at the bank, and then they're taking the $31,000 commercial paper and putting it into that bank account. So now you have a bank account with $31,000 in it. Now what they do is they take that bank account and they write a check representing you and they sign your name to it. They write a check for $31,000 and they give it to you and it's to the auto agency. So you take the check back to the auto agency and you give them the $31,000 check and so you just exchange your paperwork, which represented 31000 You give it to the bank. They put it into a bank account, wrote a check for it, and then give it back to you. So now you're giving it back to the auto agency. The auto agency is happy. They got their money. The bank is happy. They got $31,000 more. And you're happy you got the car. And they never gave you anything. They didn't loan you any money. They just translated the money that you gave them. You gave them 31000 in paperwork. They gave you $31,000 on a little piece of paperwork. It's called a check. You need to check all of this out. <laughs> and so uh, that's why we sign a check. So now that's why you don't own the car. They own the car at the bank because they wrote a check on that, on that $31,000 piece of paper. And so they have the pink slip, not you. So they own the car, not you. So you have to pay them their $31,000 that they wrote the check out of your account. You have to pay them back that $31,000 with interest because they did you a favor. They took that paper and changed it all for you and you got a nice car and they were happy, everybody's happy. And so for doing that, you have to pay them something. So you pay them interest because they have an interest in that money. They're the ones that wrote the check, and they're the ones that did it for you, so you got to pay them their interest. But the problem is, is that most people do not realize it's against the law for anyone to uh, open up a checking account in your name without you knowing it. If I go into a bank in your town and forge some kind of ID with your name on it, and I open up a bank account in your name, and I write in handwriting your name and and I get a credit card in your name and I've got a bank account in your name that's a felony you can go to prison for that that's called bank fraud that's that's identity theft you can go to prison for that unless of course you're a bank if you're a bank well, that's no problem at all you just do it because that's business that's the way we do business if you do it you go to jail but they write a check and give it to you and you give it to the auto agency and so they've written a check on your bank account and you say well they can't do that why not they're the ones that opened up the bank account <laughs> why can't they it's all inside their bank and they're, and they're the only ones that knows what's going on so they they opened up a bank account for you they wrote a check for you you got your car everybody's happy so shut up and pay your bill and be happy <laughs> and so once you understand how all of this works uh, it's a whole different world. And so you'll say, well, why do I have to pay you when uh, when I you didn't give me anything? I'm the one that gave you $31,000 when I handed you the paperwork. I gave you $31,000. You didn't give me $31,000. I gave you. You merely translated the paper and gave me back a piece of paper. And now I can take it back to the auto agency. But you didn't give me a dime. No, the banks cannot loan money. Because any money the bank has belongs to the people who put the money in the bank. And you can't give somebody else's money out on a loan. So the point being is at the end of the day, the big bank in town has loaned out, say, $500,000. $750,000 each day. Why? Because they loan, they, 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 they sign for a people to get this house that was 200,000 they signed for him to get a, a new sh boat and that was 50,000 they signed for this guy to buy a plane and this guy to buy some property and before you know it at the end of the day they've uh, written out uh, 700,000 dollars in checks where did they get the money 
they got the money because the, the, the property or the car or the boat or whatever was being paid for is on paper, and the paper represents how much that property is worth. So they write checks on it. That's the way banks work. They don't loan you nothing, but they do take interest. And that's where it gets interesting, because according to federal law, the law in the federal banking system says uh, that if anyone charges you interest uh, for money they did not loan you, that's a felony, and it comes under RICO. RICO law says, and the reason why they instituted a new law called RICO it's because of the mafia. That's what the mob does in the, in the streets of New York and Chicago. You need money, they'll give you four or five thousand, and that's very nice. They give you five thousand bucks. You needed the money, and you got it. The only problem is you're going to pay them back fifty thousand. If you don't think you're going to, yeah, well, just try not paying them, because whatever they say you owe, that's what you owe. And if you give them fifteen thousand, and they say you owe another fifteen, it just don't matter. Whatever they say you owe, that's what you owe. And if you don't pay it, you're going to get your face broke. And your family's going to get hurt. So that's called RICO. So the law was enacted that says nobody can extort money out of you for something they never gave you. The mafia, you know, well, at least they did give you the money. I mean, they charge you a hell of an interest, but at least they did give you something. The bank didn't give you nothing. They just change the paper from one piece of paper to another. So it's just interesting the way cash works, the way money works, the way government, the way law enforcement, the whole world is fascinating how the world really works. And wait till you get into religion and begin to see the connections between Islam and Judaism and Christianity and where these religions have come from, what they're based on, and who these gods are that mankind is worshiping, boy, that's when it really gets interesting. It's fascinating. When you begin to see who Allah is, and Yahweh, and Jehovah, and Jesus, and Buddha, I mean, it's a f I mean I'm fascinated with it, because it's a story will blow your mind where these gods have come from, where these different religions have come from, and what Islam really is. Islam is a corporation, it's a company. <laughs> the Vatican, where does it come from? It comes from the Lucosa Nostra, the organized crime coming out of Rome, the Sicilian, the, the gangsters, the Roman Empire, I mean, it's quite a story, the world you live in. The world you live in is nothing like you think it is. It, nothing works the way you think it does. It's a hell of a story. And that's why I like the idea of your, uh, your radio show being Humanity Awakens. Well, it's about time we awake. Absolutely. My God, yeah. how much more time are you going to be asleep? Incidentally, you know, if you're sound asleep, and you're very tired, and very, very tired, and you are really sound asleep. And someone comes into your bedroom and slips over to your bed and turns on a light that says 600 watt bulb, turns it on. Your natural human reaction would be quickly to turn away. Why? Because it hurts your eyes. You were sound asleep, and 600 watt or an 800 watt or a 1,000 watt bulb next to you, normally you would just turn away and shield your eyes. Why? Because it hurts. After you after you've shielded your eyes and woke up, it's not going to be funny. There's nothing to laugh at. Whoever did that is going to pay a hell of a price for doing that kind of a joke on you. Because you're not going to be laughing. It's not going to be funny. And so you're going to be very unhappy with whoever did that. Well, that's the same idea that when someone who is highly enlightened, a very highly intelligent person, we say they are brilliant, which means they are filled with light. Their whole life just is, is, is enlightening the world. And so if they're filled with light, we say they're brilliant. Well, if someone comes to you and you've been in the dark all your life, 
you've been asleep all of your life just going out and doing whatever it is you call yourself doing you don't know nothing you never read anything you don't understand anything and so you've been in the dark all your life and somebody comes into your life and is now enlightening you most people will turn away they don't want to hear it they don't want to hear that stuff you're talking about my government you're talking about my religion or my family I don't want to hear it that's what happens when you talk about truth I mean the the young you know the guy in on the in the movie a few good men in the movie asked the kid uh, you know what do you want from me and Tom Cruise says I want the truth and he said you can't handle the truth that's the problem people today do not want to hear the real truth because the actual legitimate provable factual truth is not what you thought it was your wife is not your loved one your wife is a corporation it's a company and it's a business and that's why you have to have a license to get married that's why your children do not belong to you it's a product between two corporations and the company is the original company is called United States Corporation they are the corporation under which you operate therefore they are the ones that gave you the license you didn't give them a license they gave you a license what you're talking about is like one of the reasons like I'm really grateful that we have you know the, this podcast because people like you said aren't always so open to hearing the truth and yeah. and being able to say hey like if you're interested in some of these subjects like tune into my podcast you know tune in check out our youtube channel like check out some of jordan maxwell stuff you know and it's a more like i found that like passively giving them an option is actually the most active uh way you can bring someone who's very closed off to this stuff to making them say i choose to look into this instead of somebody trying to force feed it to them and i sometimes i feel like that approach is exactly what people need in their awakening process would you agree on that i completely agree with that because I've noticed that over the course of the last year since I've been doing this show, um, I've learned a great deal. And I've been studying this stuff for many years. And I, I mean, what you just talked about tonight has just completely changed my world view, like really has. And solidified some things that I just, I've always believed, but I hadn't had any real proof of. And I believe that you're t- you just told me the truth. And... Mm-hmm. You know, and when I approach my friends with this, they're like, oh, you're just a conspiracy theorist. You don't know anything. I said, well, you know, if you just look into what the, how the origins of the term conspiracy theorist and where it came from and the reason why it was invented is because they were trying to discredit people who were free thinkers, people who didn't want to have, you know, the, the establishment doesn't like it when you, when you look into their, into their closets. Or just think for yourself. Exactly right. (laughs) And, you know, and, And now that we're in a situation in the world where it looks like a lot of closet doors are being opened. Yeah, well, that's my, I just remember my dad was the same way. Uh, He told me many times, you know, the closet, his closet and his chest of drawers and his, uh, in his room. uh, If you want to get hurt, serious, you come in my bedroom and I'm not here and go through my drawer and go through my, my, my closet and go through my stuff. If I ever catch you going through my stuff, it's going to be it's going to go bad on you. And so that's the way parents are. They don't, you know, telling a kid that's none of your business what I do, or who I am, and what I do. You know, I'll check your bedroom, but you don't check mine. I'm your parent. And so that's what the way government is. Government is our parent, and it looks at us as if we are the children, and so it has to take care of us. It has to, you know, it has to take care of us and feed us, because uh, we are children, and we're cattle, and they are our parent. So they can tell you what to think and what you can do. You can't do any. You can't tell them anything. Uh, and going back to the way you sign your name, uh, I said that when you sign your name, upper and lower case upper and lower case that is your flesh and blood body and there is no law there is no bill there is no uh, business can be done with a name upper and lower case upper and lower case you cannot do business with anyone who signs upper and lower case that's the law you cannot do any business with them if you're going to have a bank account you're going to pay your gas bill you're going to pay your insurance 
You pay a ticket. It must be all capital letters. Is that why they make you sign, write your name out above where you sign? Exactly. exactly. Oh, my God. Yep. And so, so why? It's because um, upper and lower case represents you, the living person, your flesh and blood, upper and lower case. But the, uh, but the corporation, uh, which you are a company, you may be bad company or a good company, but you're a company. And so since you're a company, you have to have all capital letters. And that's a company. Why? Because when you go by a cemetery in the in graveyards, you will see on the tombstones, the names are in all capital letters. We call them corpses. Why? Because they're a corporation. Mm -hmm. And now they're out of business, of course. <laughs> so they're a defunct corporation. They were in business, but now it's none of your business, but they're out of business. And so their name is on the tombstone in all capital letters because they were a corporation, a company. And that guy in particular was bad company. And these people over here were good company. It doesn't matter. They were a company. It and made me feel, that made me feel physically ill <laughs> when you yeah, said that because it just hit me so hard. Yeah, me too. <laughs> hey, oh, so, Jordan, I have a question for you. Who do you believe at this point is actually running the show? Like, oh, yeah. No, well, that's good. That's good. I'll, that's a subjective opinion. I mean, I can just give you my opinion. Okay. I mean, what do I know? Right. Uh, I've only been looking at it for 60 years, so I have no idea. But, I mean, I'll give you my opinion. I think the bottom line in this world, uh, of the real powers at the top are the Jesuits in the Catholic Church. I think the Jesuit priesthood are the real scumbags at the top of the heap. The guys who are running the planet today, all the nations of the world, international banking cartels, all the international uh, diplomacy going on between nations and peoples and, and wars, uh, the, the Jesuits are behind all of this stuff. They are brilliant people. And the black pope, there's, uh, there's a guy who heads the, uh, the Jesuits, he's called the Jesuit general. And the Jesuits are a priesthood, but they are a military order. They're purely military, and they exist for one reason only. The Jesuits are in existence for one reason only, to make damn sure nobody messes with the Holy Father. Nobody messes with the corporation called the Vatican. Nobody. I don't care if it's Russia, China, Africa, it doesn't matter. Nobody bucks the powers that be in Rome. When Rome says something, the Holy Father says something, that's the way it is. If you don't like it, because the Holy Father represents God, and he's our Holy Father. Therefore, you might say he is a Godfather. And the Godfather decides what he's, what, what you're going to do, and you bet your ass <coughs> you'll still do it. Because uh, because he has men in the streets, and that's all they do is break people's faces and break your legs. And so we call them soldiers. And so, you know, the, the, the Vatican operates like the mafia. No, actually, the mafia operates like the Vatican. And uh, it's an it's a ancient system of government and underworld, uh, uh, underworld activity, money, corruption, government. And at the bottom of the Vatican, which is Rome, the ancient Roman Empire, well, at, behind the ancient Roman Empire is a, is a particular priesthood. They're called Jesuits. And that's a really big subject, who the Jesuits are. And now when you find out that all the presidents of the United States were Jesuit trained, in Washington, D.C., there are different Jesuit universities. The Jesuits own the universities. They will not allow anyone to teach there but Jesuits. And it's got some of the Jesuit universities in Washington, D.C., one is called George Washington University. One's called uh, um, George Washington. Uh, what am I, what's some of the others? I don't know. <laughs> Off the top of my head, I can't remember right now. But but you find out the Jesuit-owned and Jesuit-run universities in Washington, D.C. Then go on the web and see who the top alumni and who the top 
people in government that graduated from that university. And you will see all the names of presidents of the United States, the vice presidents, the top <coughs> senators and congressmen, uh, you know, and the top people in the cabinet of the different presidents. They all came from Jesuit universities all the way down the line. So that should tell you something about the Jesuits. They are training the leaders of the United States Corporation. It's just a business. That's incredible. I, you know, because I've heard everything from, you know, uh, the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, the, you know, there's the the the, the extraterrestrial influence that's pre yeah. that's obviously present here. There's, well, I have the, no the, doubt. The Encyclopedia Judica, the Jewish Encyclopedia, uh, under the heading of Rothschild, go to the library and get the Jewish Encyclopedia and look under Rothschild, and it will tell you, in the Jewish Encyclopedia, it will tell you the Rothschilds were very wealthy. Why? Because they represented the Vatican's money. The Pope used old man Rothschild to manipulate the finances for him. He was too busy overseeing religion and the church and didn't have the time to uh, to know and you know do the best with the uh, with the banking. So uh, the Pope appointed Rothschild to be in charge of Vatican finances and to invest in the Vatican finances and make the Pope a lot of money because he needs a lot of money to control the world. So today we say that the Rothschilds are in everything, they're running everything. Well, yeah, but they're running it for the boss. They're running it for the Vatican. That's the people who actually own the money. And when you're running a big corporation for extremely powerful people like the Vatican, you can make a lot of money too. Of course, your $100 million a year you make, uh, you can live in an incredible mansion, but that is nothing compared to what the Vatican makes around the earth. They're making hundreds of billions while you're making $100 million? No, they're making the real money. They are, they are putting the Russians against the Americans. They're putting the Chinese against the Asians. They're putting <coughs> one country against another. They're inciting wars, international conflicts. They're making enormous amounts of money. And, of course, they also have priests who are at the confessionals. And the priests are hearing the confessions of politicians and presidents and, the, and senators and congressmen. So the, the priests who are doing the confessions know uh, which ones are gay, which ones are, are, are raping, and who's doing what, and who's doing who. And uh, so then they tell the Holy Father, so when the president goes over to talk to the Holy Father in Rome, and they had a nice conversation for 45 minutes, yeah, because the Pope reminded the president, you know, we know what you did with those boys. We got that all on tape. We know what you did. So just remember, if I ask you to do something, you just remember what I know and what I can put out there. I'm not going to put it out, but I'll have the uh, New York Times put it out. So just remember, I know what you did. I got pictures of it. My priest have told me what you did. You know, you went to confession? Yeah, well, I know what you did. So just remember that when I ask you to do something for me. So it sounds like, like the said, blackmail is like <coughs> yeah. the blackmail right. is completely widespread and it kind of keeps everyone in their little corner and uh, yeah. it, I hear it like some Pizzagate in there. I don't know if that plays into what you're talking about though. Well, <coughs> I've got a really hot subject. And this I'll I'll go with this. Um, on my website, which is Jordan Maxwell Show. S H O W. Very simple. Jordan Maxwell Show dot com. When you go to Jordan Maxwell Show dot com, it's a it's a little podcast uh, website. Um, on that podcast website, I have a bunch of old radio shows I've done podcasts that you can go back and listen to. But on Jordan Maxwell Show, I have another uh, website. That is called the Research Society website. The reason why I have that on my, my original website, Jordan Maxwell Show, is because I've been told by lawyers, some lawyer friends of mine have warned me, 
that if you are a public figure and you're used to speaking in public, which I am, you can get in trouble talking about certain subjects that uh, you're not supposed to talk about in public. And so you can get in trouble. And the, here's the way they explained it to me, that if you go with about eight or ten friends to dinner one night in a restaurant, and you're sitting in the back of the restaurant, ten of you having dinner, you can use any language uh, that, that your friends will allow. You can say anything about anybody, <coughs> about call anybody any name you want, no matter how, how, uh, how bad it is, no matter what words you use to describe people. As long as your friends are, uh, don't mind, you can say anything you want because the government doesn't care what you say. That's a private conversation. So you can call anybody anything you want, say anything, no matter how derogatory, how bad it is. Nobody cares. That's private conversation. But if you go out the next day and go on a radio show and talk about somebody like you did last night at the, at the table, now that's public. Now the government comes in because governments are empowered to protect the people. Governments are empowered to protect the people. And so they protect you from having anyone go out and, and call you names and, and have, uh, you know, you can't go out and call people stuff you used to many years ago. You can't get away with it today. Why? Because the government will not allow it. You can get in trouble for doing that. So therefore, I am told by a lawyer, friends of mine, that if you're going to talk about subjects that might possibly get you in trouble and there are those subjects I mean I you talk about freedom of speech the reason you have freedom of speech in America is because nobody knows nothing and as long as nobody really knows what's going on you can have all the freedom of speech you want but if you know something you're not supposed to know if you happen by chance to have some information that's truly devastating information about some mafia guy who killed someone or somebody you saw do something that, that was related to someone's death and you saw it with your own eyes, yeah, we have freedom of speech. Well, go out and talk about that person in public. Go out on the radio and talk about what you <coughs> saw them do and what happened and who they killed and watch what happens to you. So no, we don't have freedom of speech. You have freedom of speech as long as you talk about things that are not important. But if you know something you're not supposed to about the mafia, you better keep your mouth shut. Because if they find out that you know something you're not supposed to know, you're in danger. So they have to give you a different name and give you a witness protection program and get you out of town because somebody's going to kill you to protect the, the organization. So my point being is that if you are a radio talk show host or if you are on the radio and you're going to talk about something important, you better watch what you're saying. You better watch your mouth because you can get in trouble, not just with the cops and the police, but if you say something about some guy, he's liable to kill you. You never Absolutely. know what you're I think never that know. walking that fine line is extremely important when talking about these things. And it's like the truth needs to be told. But, you know, I believe that there's a way to do it in a tactful way. And, uh, you know, doing it in a way that people can reciprocate with and, um, you know, just having tact with how we do it. Yeah. It's about yeah. passing on information, but doing it in such a way that you're not accusing anybody specifically. Um, well, that's right. So that's why I was saying the, the lawyer told me if, if you're going to present documents, uh, uh, written documents or materials that's very controversial that could get you in trouble. Government doesn't want you to know, and you don't, you're not supposed to know about. And if you put those out in the public, don't be surprised if you get a knock on the door from the FBI or from the CIA or from a Homeland Security or something and are put under arrest because you're talking about something you got no business talking about in public. And you can go to prison for that. So I am told by my lawyers that if you're gonna have stuff on, on your website, that's going to be really controversial, and really interesting stuff that people don't know. You better make it private. You better talk privately in the restaurant between your friends in the corner, not in the public. Mm. And so the way you do that, I'm told the way you do that is you form a second uh, 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 website. 
And on that website, you have people join the website purposely. So I and you and they and you have to have them pay to join, which means that they are now in a private relationship with you. They have paid a, to to be a part of your private group that you talk to. Now anything you say on that website, <coughs> you're protected. You're protected by it, and they are listening to and reading something they're not supposed to know about. So they're protected, as long as they keep it. To themselves right now if uh, if I got something on that's very dangerous and you are you go on and read it then you go out and talk about it in public I'm not in trouble you're in trouble you're the one that made it public not me I kept it I kept it private gotcha and I so like that I'm, little loophole yeah. so that's what I'm saying I now have a private research website called research society so if you want to join my research society where I've got all of my dark stuff, all the audio, video, uh, research papers, documents, um, uh, articles, pictures, diagrams, all kinds of stuff I've been looking at all my life. And I've got tons of stuff on there. I've got a huge amount of stuff getting ready to go up. <laughs> I got like four terabytes uh, a four terabyte external hard drive filled with knowledge that most people have no idea about at all. Four thousand gigs. That's incredible, uh, Jordan. I, I mean, I'm a music producer for a living, and I have a one terabyte hard drive that I've been using to record artists with the past couple of years, and I'm not even close to filling that up halfway. So the fact that you're right. saying you have four terabytes full of information is absolutely incredible. That's, a, that's I've got four yeah. terabytes of research documents, pictures, documents, uh, letters, private letters, pictures, uh, all kinds of strange off-the-wall information about stuff that happens in life. You know, what, about the government, about banking, about the police department, about government, about uh, wars and who's financing who and where does it come from and what does it mean. Uh, just an extraordinary amount of, of, uh, of material that I could get in trouble for and some of it. And so I put it all into private. So I'm just saying that that private research is called uh, Research Society website. I charge $30 for a one-time lifetime subscription for $30 one time, um, which helps me to pay the, uh, my webmaster and keep the, keep the website on the web because it costs money. And I don't have any money. I'm 76 years old and don't really have lots of money. So I spent all my money doing what I do and woke up one day broke <laughs> and uh, knowledgeable <coughs> but broke. So uh, it cost me a lot of money to do what I've done in my life, and I've lost everything. So, so that small uh, donation I'm just saying, goes if you're really a long interested way. In, if you're really interested in this kind of thing I'm talking about, then go on my website, Jordan Maxwell Show, and join my research society. And there's an enormous amount of secret stuff on there that you're not gonna, you won't believe. I've got some great stuff on there that. Uh, I don't want to talk about in public. I won't even mention it on a radio show, but it's on there. Awesome. And it's usually it's usually Amazing. in the area called um, interesting documents or something like that. Interesting articles. I've got a I've got a section called interesting articles. Some of those articles can get you put in jail if people found you know, if the government finds out you have those articles, you have those laws, and that kind of paperwork. But I'm making it out there privately. I'm putting it out privately. Well, I know I'm most likely going to join right after this show. <laughs> um, I mean, if you guys are looking for the deep stuff, Jordan's got the goods. But, well, um, Jordan, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. This has been absolutely amazing. incredible. I'm just, uh, wow. <laughs> We're going to have well, to get you, you on again in the future. Yeah, that, that's, that's, uh, I, I find it to be fun. And I enjoy talking to people who want to know that's the problem in this world too many people don't want to know you know and so there you know none so blind as those who choose not to see and so too many people in this world don't know anything why because they don't want to know they're not interested to know they don't want to hear it they don't want to hear anything 
So when they get in trouble and they get ripped off or they're thrown into prison, oh, now they want to find out what's going on. Why are they in jail and prison? Well, you should have woke up a long time ago and figured out how the world really works. And so if it's not important to you until you're drafted and you're now in the military, and now you're going to go to war and you don't know why, and there's no reason you, you can't figure out what's going on, well, it's too late now. You know, it's way too late, so don't even bother. You're too far behind.